Good evening and welcome to our program. This series is focusing on This Is Your FBI. This Is Your FBI was a radio crime drama which aired in the United States on ABC from April 6, 1945 to January 30th, 1953 for a total of 409 shows. The show featured true cases from the FBI and was told from an FBI agent's viewpoint. FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover gave it his endorsement, calling it our show and calling it the finest dramatic program on the air. Generally, I do not include advisories. Given Hoover's polarizing nature, I will share this. Dramatized stories created for propaganda purposes are not history. They tell one biased side of the story, and in no way am I saying that these are reliable stories. I just believe them to be interesting when viewed through the scope of entertainment and weird history. Finally, I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to standalone media, we have included a link in the description. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In just a moment, we'll bring you This Is Your FBI. Every week, millions and millions of people listen to this program. That is proof of national interest in one of our great national services, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And the sponsor of This Is Your FBI, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, is proud of this national interest in security. For this is the spirit that prompted the Equitable Society's founders 86 years ago to create a life assurance society dedicated to financial security. And today, three and a quarter million members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States bear witness to the usefulness, strength, and stability of an organization that by serving Equitable Society members serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Swampland Kidnapping. Stretching almost from coast to coast across the southern portion of the state of Florida is the great American jungle known as the Everglades a vast and uncharted reptile-infested area of treacherous cypress swamps and marshlands, into which only the most foolhardy would dare to venture without a guide. And, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, sometimes it can be a grave mistake to venture into the Everglades with a guide. <laughs> A few miles inland from the Gulf Coast and reached by a crooked chain of stagnant swamp lakes is the ramshackle cabin of Tom Blanton and his wife, Bess. But little sunlight manages to penetrate the patchwork canopy of intertwining cypress trees. It is fading rapidly now as Blanton makes his way along a footpath between bogs up to the cabin by the back way. You can wash up, Tom. Supper's most ready. Yeah, powerful hungry, too. Did you fix up that whole mess of catfish? I... Bess. What, Tom? You got three plates on the table. Didn't you see his motorboat tied up to the route? I come the back way. Whose boat? We got pretty special company, Tom. What company? Who's come here, Bess? Somebody we ain't seen in a mighty long time. Who are you talking to? Now, Tom, don't go getting all right. I said, who are you talking about? Our boy, Danny. 
So he came back uh, after I told him not to. Tom, what do you think? Danny's been to all them big cities like Chicago and New York. And, and... he can start back from right now, too. Now, wait, Tom. When I run him off from here, I said it was for good, and I meant it best. But Danny's our boy. He ain't none of mine no more. Tom, he's just here for a visit. Well, he ain't going to stay here another minute, Doc. Hello, Pop. Your welcome's most touching. Now, Danny, he don't mean what he said. He was just... You shut up and keep out of this, Bess. Yeah, ma, you keep out. This is between me and the old man. I'm giving you five minutes, Dan. Get your stuff and get out of here. You heard, ma. I come here for visit. No, you... And I'm staying for a while. Why, oh, you low-down swamp rat. Danny, what are you doing with that pistol? Stay way out, Pop. Danny. You're yellow, huh? Have to pull a gun on me. I just wanted to stop you with it before I had to hurt you with my hand. And just you put that gun down, we'll see whether you Shut can... Shut up and listen. I didn't come back here because I was dying to see you. What you want I here? I got as much use for you as you have for me. But here, take a look at this. Daddy, all that money. I'll pay for my keep, old man, and here's 50 on account. But... <laughs> look at him grab. Good Lord, this look. Fifty dollars. And there'll be more where that fifty come from if you don't ask a lot of questions. You mean it? I'm going down to coast tomorrow, and I'm bringing a friend back with me for a few days. Who is your friend, Danny? Now, Bess, Bess, look here. You, you, you heard what he said about asking questions. Put the supper on. Sit right down, son. Make yourself to home. And you call me a swamp rat. <laughs> Shortly after dawn, two mornings later, the well-to-do James J. Fillmore stepped into the small motorboat he had chartered for a day of deep fishing in the Gulf. But instead of the craft putting out into the Gulf, it cruised along shore for a few minutes, then suddenly turned into a stream leading back into the swamp country. I say, here, Captain, where are we going? The weather don't look so good for deep fishing, Mr. Fillmore. What? We're going fishing in the Everglades. The Everglades? Look here, young man, you might have consulted me before changing my plans. That might have spoiled my plans, Mr. Fillmore. What? What do you mean? Just take it easy. I've already mailed your wife in Sarasota some first instructions. You've done what? Sure. And if she does what I tell her to, everything will be okay with you. Look here, you don't mean you're... That's you're... right, Fillmore. You're going to visit me for a while until your missus buys your bag. No, no, you don't. Turn this boat about right now Take or I'll... Take it easy, you feel more. Fillmore? Yes. We're special agents of the FBI. Oh, yes. Please come in. The note instructed me not to call the FBI or the police, but I just can't cope with this alone. You did the proper thing in calling the FBI, Mrs. Fillmore. And you may be sure we shall do nothing that will further jeopardize the safety of your husband. Oh, poor Jim. If I had been home, maybe he, he would have taken me with him and this wouldn't have happened. You were not at home when your husband left? No, I... I had been up in Tampa for a few days visiting friends. When did you return? Just last night. I found the note from him saying that he'd gone away on a hurried business trip. Or did the note say where he was going? No. No, it didn't. Do you have any idea where he might have gone? No. We come down here every winter, and after a few day weeks, Jim gets a little re restless and goes to call on some of the people with whom he does business. I see. Well, may we have the note, please? Yes. Here you are. Thank you. Hmm. Look, Grant, Sarasota postmark, mailed right here in the city. Yeah. 6.30 p.m. yesterday. And Mr. Fillmore left home yesterday, so the abduction could have taken place right in this vicinity. Mm, not necessarily. Kidnapping could have taken place in Palm Beach or wherever it was Fillmore went. In which case, the kidnapper came back here and mailed the letter? That would certainly be safer for the kidnapper than mailing it from his actual point of operations. What does it say? Your husband's plans have been changed, but do as you are told and you'll be... he'll be okay. Oh, but that don't say what I'm to do. Don't call the police or the FBI. Don't get excited. 
stay at home. You'll receive further instructions later. Well, what's the first move, Grant? We'll check the note for fingerprints and possible identification. Let's go. to ask any questions about him and his friend, Tom. Yeah, but I got—I reckon a man's got a right best to know what's going on under his own roof. Well, their business is their business, and you best leave them alone in there. But you seen the cut on that fella's head, seems me. Danny said his friend took a fall in the boot. Yeah, well, I don't believe it. Where are you going, Tom? I'm going in there and find out, but... Going somewhere, Pop? Look here, Dan, I want to... Shut up what... and sit down. Where's that box of writing paper I hid? Let me see now. Uh, uh, oh, here it is, Danny. Okay. My friend wants to write a letter. Look here, Dan, I, I want... shut up. If you want any more dough instead of a dose of lead, you'll stay shut up, okay? Okay, Fillmore, this time your wife's going to get a letter from you. No, she isn't. Take a sheet of paper out of this box with your own fingers. There's a pencil. I'm not writing any letter to anybody. No? And you won't get away with this. Kidnappers never get away with it. That really frightens me, you know. Maybe I better turn you loose. If you're smart, you will. Okay, Mr. Fillmore, I'll turn you loose. All right, you're joking with me. No, but I'm on the same... level. You can go. But you'll have to get out of the big cypress swamp all by yourself. And on foot. If I thought you meant I that... I said I was on the level. But remember this. I don't know nobody who ever got out without a guide. No? No. The swamp's full of rattlesnakes. Cottonmouth moccasins. Alligators. We even got lions in there, Mr. Fillmore. If one of them don't get you... The wrong step with. What do you mean? Sometimes it looks innocent, just like any other piece of ground, till you step on it. Then it's got you for keeps. You, you mean the... Yeah, the bog. You start going down, see? And you start yelling and screaming for help, and all the time it keeps sucking you down, down, down. You yell, you scream louder and louder and louder, and then all of a sudden... It's quiet again. You sunk out of sight. But maybe you can beat the swamp, Mr. Fillmore. There's a door you want to try? No. No, of course not. I haven't got a chance. Okay, then my services as a guide are going to cost you $50,000. So pick up that pencil and start writing what I tell you. <laughs> Look, Grant, the ransom note was postmarked in Sarasota just as the other note was. Mm -hmm. I felt certain it would be. And the hideout can't be too far away. But we've got no lead to it. I know, but... And we still can't take any openly offensive action to uncover the hideout until Mr. Fillmore is out of danger. No, no, please don't. Are you positive, Mrs. Fillmore, that this note was written by your husband? Yes, yes, it was. I'm positive. And he's pretty certain to be safe so far. But what are we going to do about the ransom? Well, my advice is to follow the instructions in the note in every detail. You mean... There's still time for you to draw the money out of the bank. Yes. Then we'll have it in your mailbox down at the road by 10 o'clock tonight, as instructed. Supper started before. It... Tom, what are you doing? Hush up, Bess. Danny catches you listening at their door. I said, hush up. Okay, Fillmore, it's time I was stopping for You better soon. come away from me. Listen, they're talking. My wife thought enough of you to leave the 50000 in the mailbox. Like I said, I'll come back and take you out of the swamp. If the money is not there, I'll come back anyway. And make sure you never get out of the swamp. 
Well, I'm a lot What are they saying, Tom? They think you're a fool either way, because you'll never get away with it. As I told you before, kidnappers never get away with I'll it. I'll worry about that, Fillmore. You just keep up. He sure ain't going to get away with oh, it, so mister. You've been snooping at the door, huh? I sure I have, I and you... I told you to keep your dirty nose out of my business. I told you, Pa. Shut up, woman. Okay, so now you know what's going on. And I say you ain't going to get away with Don't it. Don't figure on going to the cops, because I'll blast you. But even if you got to the cops, you and Ma'd both be in a jam. What do you mean? After all, your house is a hideout, so you're both in it, same as me. Why, you low-down, crawling piece and don't try Tom. to get your gun off that chair, because I'm closer to it than you are this you're time. Down. Oh, I could... oh, Danny! You killed him, Tom. I reckon it was him or me. I'm sorry it had to turn out this way, sir, but in doing so, it has brought me my freedom. So the least I can do is see to it that you are amply rewarded. I reckon that won't be necessary, mister. What do you mean? I mean we're going to collect that $50,000 now. In New England today, April 19th is Patriot's Day. Before returning to the case on the Swampland kidnapping, let me tell you what Patriot's Day should mean to Americans. This week at the Equitable Society, four famous lines from Emerson kept running through my mind. Lines written about something that happened on the 19th of April, 1775. The Battle of Lexington. The day right after Paul Revere's ride. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Those heroic lines in praise of self-reliant men make your heart beat faster, don't they? And they should, because self-reliance is an American quality that is just as priceless today as it was in 1775. It's the backbone of the American way of life. And just to prove that it's still a factor in our country's progress, let me give you the number of people who belong to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. It's three and a quarter million. Three and a quarter million people, men and women, who have proved that they believe in taking care of themselves and their families by their own efforts. That's self-reliance for you. That's proof of thrift and cooperation, too. Together, these three and a quarter million people have built the Equitable Life Assurance Society into a fortress of financial strength. They've put together a great protective fund which gives each member far more security than he could achieve individually. They're carrying on that tradition, which enables us to say that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Society is building security for you, your home, and your country. Now back to the FBI file, the Swampland Kidnapping. In following its policy in kidnapping cases of remaining quietly in the background during the ransom negotiations, the FBI greatly handicaps itself in the task of apprehending the criminal. But to the FBI, the safe return of the victim has right of way over all other considerations. After that, there is time enough to catch the criminal. And as the victim in tonight's case said, kidnappers never get away with it. Several hours have passed now since Tom Blanton shot down his son Dan during their fight in the Blanton cabin deep in the Big Cypress Swamp where the kidnapped victim, James Fillmore, is being held. Just outside of Sarasota, the old house on the Fillmore estate is dark and seems deserted. But at a front window, three figures keep silent and constant vigil. The only sounds are the rustle of the night breeze through the palm trees and the roll of the surf a hundred yards away. Can you see the dial on your watch, Grant? Mm -hmm. Two minutes of ten. Two minutes to go. He will come at ten, like you said, won't he? The note said only to have the money in the mailbox at the road by ten. But surely that means he planned to pick it up at that time. Well, we can only wait and see. But what if he doesn't come for the money? This crime's been committed for money, Mrs. Fillmore. 
I'm confident somebody will come for it. If they don't make it by ten grand, how much time? Shh. Listen. What was it? Thought I heard. Wait a minute. It's a car. Oh, thank heaven. Don't let us make a move now. Watch. Must be pulling up to the mailbox now. I wish there were a moon. Somebody's getting out. Yeah. Can't tell anything about him from here, though. Just a shadow. Listen. He's opening the mailbox. Well, what are you young men waiting for? What do you mean? Aren't you going out there and catch him? Oh, no. What do you mean you're going to let him get away? Shh. We meant to let him get away, Mrs. Fillmore. Oh, your know. husband is not out of danger yet. It's our job first to get your husband back, and then to catch the kidnapper. I think it's safe now to go down and take a look at the mailbox? I think so. Let's go. Did you get it, Bess? Was it there? Sure, I got it. Let's get in the house out of this rain. Oh, now you oughtn't to mind little rain now, Bess girl. We're rich. In the little rain. Looks like it's been raining here ever since I left. Now, Bess, don't go getting cantankerous. I'm holding you to your promise, Tom. You promised to take me out in this swamp if I'd done what you told me to do tonight. I will, I will. Now, come on. Well, I trust your mission was successful, sir. Sure thing. Best found the money, just like you said. And now that I bought my freedom? You ain't got another worry, mister. Now you might as well go to bed and get yourself a good night's sleeping. Go to bed? Well, I ain't gonna take you out in the swamp till morning, that's for sure. But uh, you will then? <laughs> oh, sure. Me and my woman will be going away then ourselves. Very well. Good night, mister. I was just thinking, Tom. Eh? Huh? About what? I'd like to turn him loose, same as you, but it ain't safe. What you mean? He knows who we are now, and he'll tell the police all about us. And no matter where we go, they'll be looking for us. Yeah. Sure, you're right, Bess. We can't let him go. But what are we going to do with Don't him? Don't you worry now. I'll figure that out come morning. And I think I got an idea already. You must go to bed, Mrs. Fillmore, and, and try to get a night's sleep. I won't sleep a wink, Mr. Grant, until my husband is back home safely. Well, the note said he would be returned by morning. What if something goes wrong? Oh, you mustn't think of that. But things do go wrong in these cases, I know. We got a good picture of the kidnapper, Grant. Good. Picture? Yes, Mrs. Fillmore. We had planted an infrared camera in the mailbox. What? And it automatically took a picture of the person who opened the mailbox to get the money. And it was a woman, Grant. A woman? Here you are. Look. Hmm. Wearing a raincoat. I already checked on that, and I got our first big lead. What do you mean? I figured wherever she drove in from, it was raining. Uh -huh. Well, I checked with the Weather Bureau, and the only place it's been raining tonight is down in the big Cypress Swamp area. Cypress Swamp, huh? Is... Is your husband a fisherman, Mrs. Fillmore? Yes, he loves to fish. Has he ever gone fishing in the Everglades? Yes, he has. At a town called Everglades. Now we're getting somewhere. Come on, Monroe. That's where we're going. <laughs> Are you the innkeeper? Yes, sir. We're special agents of the FBI. Uh, oh, what can I do for you? Do you know a Mr. James J. Fillmore? 
Why, yes. Uh, he come down here a couple of days ago for a little fishing. But you haven't seen him since? No, sir. Something wrong? Whose boat did he charter? Well, now you got me there. I know the regular charter boats was all busy. M must have made a deal with one of the private boats. Eh? Would you know which one? Let me see now. Couldn't have been Charlie Bates. He just sold his little outfit a couple of days ago. Uh, who bought it? I think he said he sold it to Dan Blanton. Uh, he's been away a long time, Dan has. Just come back a couple of days ago. Where does Blanton live? Why, his folks got a cabin back in the swamps a few miles. Maybe they know. Could we get there tonight? <laughs> Couldn't possibly start for daylight. Even then, you need a guide, you know. I see. Do you recognize the woman in this picture? Here, let me see some. Why, sure, sure. That's old Tom Blanton's wife, Bess. Why? You rustle us up a boat and a guide, and you'll find out why. We hope. <laughs> Come on out, mister. Best and me's ready to get going now. But uh, it's the middle of the night. I thought you said we couldn't leave before morning. Uh, we ain't all going. What? You see, Best and me was talking it over, and we decided since you know all about us, who we are and what we look like and all... Well? We decided it wouldn't be safe for us to turn you loose. Look here. You've got the money. What else do you want? Just like I said, we can't turn you loose. What do you mean? I mean, we got to leave you behind. No, no, you can't do that. I'd never get out of here on foot alone. We ain't aiming for you to get out at all. What? Better go in the other room, Bess. Oh, you're wasting time, Tom. Get it over no, with. No, wait a minute. If the money you've got is not enough, I'll give you more. It's just like she said, we're wasting time. We can't take a chance on leaving you here alive. No, no, for heaven's sake, you can't do that to... Stand back, Bess, I'm going to... No, no! Drop that gun, Blanton. Who you would come busting in here like... Special agents of the FBI, and I said to drop that gun. I ain't aiming to drop no gun for no... Here. Take his gun, Monroe. Are you all right, Mr. Fillmore? Yes, thanks to you gentlemen. There seems to be one member of the party missing. Where's your son, Mrs. Blanton? His father here shot him and threw his body in a swamp bog. And that's what these two are about to do with me. All right, get out from there, Blanton. My wife. Is she all right? We telephoned. She'll be waiting in Everglades for you when we come out of the swamp. Let's go. After having been tried for the murder of their son... Thomas Blanton and his wife, Bess, were both convicted and sentenced to die in the electric chair. There have been some abduction cases, such as the one you have just heard, in which the criminals were afraid to release their victims because of the information they could furnish the FBI or the police. The stupidity of this reasoning should be obvious. To add murder to the crime of abduction is to furnish one more indelible clue which serves only to shorten the criminal's road to inevitable justice. Before telling you about next week's exciting case, let me remind you again that just as you look to your FBI for national security... So to the equitable society, you look for the financial security of life insurance. Yes, like the FBI agent, the equitable society representative in your community is a specialist on the subject of security. His job is to preserve homes, to help keep children in school, and to make old age a time of happiness and contentment. It's a good job, and one that has won for him the respect and confidence of his fellow citizens who recognize his contribution to the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the salesmen of espionage.
The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweets. The music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Salesman of Espionage. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Freedom has been part of our American life for so long that people have grown used to it. And some of us don't realize what a priceless thing it is. For instance, you're free to tune in tonight's FBI file, which will begin in just a moment, or any program, long wave or short wave, pro or con, any time you like. Yes, America, there are no pressures, no orders that you must or must not listen to certain things. And the Equitable Life Assurance Society is a good example of this freedom of choice. Membership in the Equitable Society is purely voluntary. But the advantages are so great that three and a quarter million Americans have elected to become members, that is, policyholders. And more and more people are joining it every year, staying in it, and reaping the benefits of membership in this mutual organization, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Truly, the Equitable Society is an American institution, for by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Nylon Hijacker. It has been said that the female of the species is more deadly than the male. And while this expression applies zoologically only to certain of the lower animals and insects, tonight's case from the files of your FBI demonstrates that in the field of human crime, no male could be any more deadly than the female who is motivated by a desire for revenge. <laughs> In one of those cheap cold water flats across the East River from Manhattan, a pretty-faced young girl in a red chenille robe sits staring into a cup of coffee gone cold. She's been awake all night waiting for the sound of certain footsteps in the hall which never come. Suddenly, the girl straightens. But it is not his knock. He wouldn't knock. He'd use his key. Hiya, Bunny. Chris, what are you doing here this early? Just give me an aspirin and a bottle of beer quick. Huh? Kid, your big sister is really hung over. Oh, come on in. I I'll get you an aspirin right away, Chris. Okay, and I'll die for the icebox. Oh. Where's Frankie? Frankie? Mm hmm. Oh, he, uh, uh, he's, he's not here. Uh-huh. 
Hey, is this all the beer you got? Well, take it, Chris. I ordered some more this morning. Okay. Where's an opener? Uh, right on the table. Oh, oh, yes, well. Here's the aspirin, Chris. Thanks, kid. <sighs> that should do something. Hey, you don't look so hot, Bunny. What's the matter? Oh, I, uh... Well, I didn't sleep very good last night. He didn't come home, did he? What? You heard me. Frankie didn't come home. No. I thought so. Chris, I... I'm scared stiff. I, I'm afraid he's gotten into some kind of trouble. Is that what you really think, honey? What do you mean? Look, kid, you're my sister, and I tear my hair out for you. You know that, don't you? Of course, Chris. And have I ever lied to you? No. Then you ought to know I wouldn't come all the way over here at 8 o'clock in the morning and with a hangover to boot to start lying to you now. What are you talking about, Chris? I know why Frankie didn't come home to you last night. You do? Yeah. And I know why he didn't come home the other two times. Well, well what, what happened to him? Frankie has given you the business, kid. He's got a dame. Chris! I saw him together last night. Oh, no, no, Chris. You must have made a mistake. Not a chance. But Frankie wouldn't do that to me. Oh, wake up, kid. He is doing it. But he it. promised me. He promised he'd never look at another girl. Oh, honey, why don't you grow up? But I tell you, he promised. He promised to take out of this dump, too, didn't he? Yes, and he's going to as soon as he does a job or two and gets some money. I know for a fact Bunny, that he... shut up and listen to me. Frankie's making good dough already. He's got a racket. What? I don't know what it is, but I found out that much, and it's paying off. But he never told me anything about it. Of course not. He's spending it all on that redhead. What redhead? The one I've seen him with. Oh. She's got a car and an apartment. Oh. And I'll give you one guess on who's paying for it. Who's paying? Oh, no, Chris. And when he gets ready to give you the brush off for keeps, he'll do that, too. <laughs> now, look, kid, when you married that rat, I washed my hands, but... I won't take you getting shoved around this way. Oh, this is awful. <laughs> you can't handle a guy, but I can. So just let me know the next time he's home, and I'll be right here to really straighten that stiff out. In the New York City office of the FBI next morning... An assistant to the agent in charge is just finishing a telephone conversation as Special Agent York enters. All right. Yes. Yes, we'll get on it right away. And thanks a lot. New business, John? Yes, interstate hijacking. Oh? A truckload of nylons. Nylons? <laughs> well, who did it, your wife or mine? <laughs> no, York, I'm afraid they both got scooped on this one. Where did it happen? In Jersey, on the highway the other side of Hoboken. Uh-huh. Truck stopped at an intersection for a light. Three men stepped out of the shadows and did the rest. Anybody hurt? Well, they knocked the driver out. He came to about an hour later, made his way to the police and reported. Could he furnish any lead? Well, the police are questioning him now. Well, they must have brought the nylons on into New York. That's right. Truck was found abandoned at, here it is, Broadway and 125th. Uh, probably miles from where they unloaded it. Yeah, I would think so. You know, this must be a new mob operating. That's the first interstate hijacking job around here since we broke up the Niles gang. Do you want me to do anything? Yes, will you go over to police headquarters and get the driver's testimony? Right. Then you'd better examine the truck, see if you can pick up any prints. Okay. And York, check with me later. Let me know what you found. Coming. Hiya, Bunny. Oh, uh, hello, Chris. Well, ain't you going to ask me in? Oh, sure. Uh, um, come ahead. Is he home? Who? Now, who do you think? Uh, Frankie? That's right. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he's home. I thought you were going to get in touch with me when he showed. Well, you see, Chris, I... Where this, is uh... he? Sitting right over here, scared to death of you, hot shot. Oh. Please, Chris, you were wrong about Frankie. He explained about that girl and everything's fine. Yeah, I'll bet he explained. Did he tell you about Why the... Why don't you keep your ugly kisser out of other people's business? Bunny's my sister, and I don't like the way you're giving her the business. 
What's the matter? You're jealous because nobody ever gives you a break like I did, Bunny? Why, you cheap little five-and-dime racketeer, I'll... Shut up. Frankie. Tell this big mouth to get out of here. Please go, Chris. Everything's all right between us now. You keep quiet. You heard a hot shot blow. Oh, no. I told Bunny I was going to come over here and straighten you out with her, but now I've changed my mind. Great. Fine. So beat it. I changed my mind because you can't make anything else out of a rat but a rat, and I don't want her to go on living with one. Well, you do. Frankie, don't cheat my sister. That's your tough luck. I told you he'd brush you off for keeps as soon as he got ready, Bunny, but I was wrong. He's a two-timing bully that's got to have somebody to kick around all the time, and you're it. Oh, Chris, please, please. He can't bully anybody in his mob. They'd give him a belly full of lead. And the first time he kicks that redhead around, she'll stick a knife in his back. Chris! And he knows if he takes a swing at me, I'll blow his brains all over the joint. I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, Frankie, don't. I've had enough. Oh, see what you've done, Chris. Frankie, don't go. Don't leave me. Please, Let don't. Go. Oh. Frankie! <laughs> Sorry, kid. He hit me. Well, what did you expect? Well, that was a very mean thing for him to do. He was just looking for an out, kid. You mean for keeps? Sure. Oh, Chris. <laughs> now, look, that ain't worth crying over. You're better off that he's gone. But now I won't get any stockings. What stockings? From the hijacking. What are you talking about? Frankie hijacked a whole truck load of nylons last oh, night. Oh, stop, will you? Honest, he did. I heard him call up some men this morning to try to sell them. Look, there's the list right over there that he was working from. This, uh, this one over here? Yep. He promised me I could have as many nylons as I wanted. And Chris, you as a girl know just how tough it is Wait to get... Wait a minute. Huh? I think we can get more than nylons out of that character. What do you mean? Give me the phone book, quick. Yes? Um, I'm calling for Frankie Austin. Oh. Frankie wants to know if you can use some nylon. So soon? I just got 3000 from him. Oh, um, uh, well, you see, these were for another customer, but he couldn't raise the cash, so Frankie thought you might want to nail these down, too. Sure, sure, I could use some more, all right. How many has he got? Uh, 6,000 pairs. Say, that's fine. When can he deliver them? How about tonight? The sooner the better. Same place? Well, uh, Frankie, you don't like to deliver twice at the same time and place. I see. Here's what he said for you to do. Have the cash with you, and at 10 o'clock tonight, bring your pickup truck to the intersection of highway... Can I come in, John? Sure, come in, York. How'd you make out? Well, I went to police headquarters and interviewed the truck driver. And? Well, he doesn't remember too much about the hijacking. He stopped at an intersection when the three men ganged up on him. Could he describe them? He gave me a fair description on one of them. I, I have it right here. Uh, nothing on the other two? No. Huh? How about the truck? Oh, I went up and looked it over. There were over a dozen different fingerprints scattered around. I'm having them worked up now. Well, chances are none of them will belong to the thieves. Yeah, I know. Well, this one description may be of some help, though. How's that? We checked the police files. It tallies pretty closely with a man who's done this sort of job before. Who's that? A racketeer named Frankie Austin. You know where he is? Not yet, but I'm going to work on that right now. Good. If you find him, bring him in. Gee, Chris, isn't it about time Mr. Fulton was coming? He, uh... You ought to be driving up any minute now. Chris, I... I'm scared. So am I, but not for the same reason. What do you mean? I'm scared he might have got suspicious and backed out. Oh. C can I turn on the radio? You could attract more attention by screaming. What do you mean? Never mind. You stay just like you are, kid, and after tonight we're going to start making money out of those big blue eyes and empty head of yours. Oh, Chris, what a thing to say about your own sister. Wait a minute. There's a little truck pulling up at the intersection now. Oh, 
Do you think it's... Well, I flash the headlights. But suppose it's not him. He answers. It's him, all right. I just sit tight. Is that you, Frankie? Pull in behind us. Stop and cut out your lights and then come back here. Where's Frankie? Do what I tell you. Just sit right where you are, Bunny. What have you got there? A jack handle, darling. I thought Frankie was going to be here. Have you got the ten grand? Sure. Where is it? Right in this envelope. Cash? Yes. That's all I wanted to know, Mr. Fuck. Now, this envelope for me, and one for him. There. And that's that. Chris, you're not going to leave him there. Sure. Oh, pull him out of the middle of the road. He might get hurt. <laughs> Now, before tonight's FBI file resumes, as it will in just a moment, a word about psychology from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. This week at the Equitable Society, I had lunch with a brand new policyholder whose lively conversation made me feel better myself. And I asked him, do all the folks from your part of the country talk with so much pep? Well, he grinned at me and said, well, I come from a lively state. But right now, I've got more pep than I've ever had in my life. You see, I've just invested in life insurance with my town's Equitable Society representative. And you know, a very interesting thing is happening to me. I feel my worries dropping away, and I never knew till now how they drag me down. Yes, sir, my mind is beginning to function at full speed, not just part of it, but all of it. All the things that have been holding me back are disappearing. The whole world's a grand place. Yes, it's great to be alive when a man's mind is at peace. Well, you know, you're likely to benefit in more ways than you realize when you let your Equitable Society representative help you get free from whatever financial worries may be destroying your peace of mind. With his help, security comes easily, for he's an expert in protection. And he represents an institution which has been a tower of financial strength and stability since 1859, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Yes, this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. Now, back to the FBI file, The Nylon Hijacker. The frame-up crime is one of the most popular instruments of revenge employed by members of the underworld society against each other. But in planting clues intended to incriminate their foe, they rarely fail to leave some track which leads eventually to their own guilt. It was nearly midnight before a highway patrolman discovered the body of the man named Fulton lying on the road about 100 yards from the highway intersection. Early next morning in the FBI office. Good morning, John. Good morning, York. I think I finally got a line on Frankie Austin's whereabouts. Swell. With any luck, we should pick him up this afternoon. Well, we certainly have... Oh, wait a minute, will you? Sydney speaking. This is Jersey Highway Patrol Headquarters, Mr. Sydney. Yes. We would have called you sooner on this, but we spent all night checking angles. Well, what have you got? Looks like something that ties in with the nylon hijacker. York, better get on the other phone and listen to this. Okay. All right, shoot. We found the body of a man named Fulton last night near the intersection of 64 and 22. Yes, Checked the identification card in his wallet and found out he's a dealer in women's stockings. Oh? The thing that really ties it in is the typewritten note we found on him. Well, what is it? It said 3,000 pairs of nylons would be delivered to him at the intersection last night at 10 o'clock. 
Fulton was to bring $10,000 in cash with him. Oh? Well, who signed that note? It was just signed Frankie. Well, that must be Frankie Austin. Uh, do you know whether Fulton had the money with him when he got there? We checked his office a while ago. He drew that much from the bank yesterday about noon. Well, I see. Our well, special agent York is leaving here at once. He'll go over details with you and check on the scene of the crime. Right. Thanks a lot, officer. Bye. Goodbye. Well, that seems to be the clincher on Austin. Yeah. York, tell me where you think he's going to be this afternoon. While you're gone, I'll have somebody hop out and pick him up. Right. Austin. Yes, sir? You might as well come clean. The evidence against you will be here any minute now. I don't care what evidence you got. I didn't knock that guy off. What about the note? How many times do I have to tell you? It's a frame. Now, who would want to frame you? I don't know. Why would they want to frame you? I don't know that either. Then what makes you so sure it's a frame up? Look, gee, man, I tell you, I didn't have Maybe you tried to, to cut it. somebody out after hijacking that truckload of nylons. That's a lie. It was my own job. Oh. Well, at least we got that much settled. Okay, okay. So I knocked off the truck, but I didn't kill that guy full. Then where were you at 10 o'clock last night? I wasn't wherever he was. Can you prove that? Sure I can. Well? I was at a certain dame's house. I thought you were married. I am married. Does your wife know about the other girl? What's that got to do with proving where I was last Are night? Are you still living with your wife? What's that got Austin, to... Austin, answer my question. I walked out on her yesterday. Have a fight about the other girl? My wife's sister started it. She hates my guts, and when she found out about that dame... Can I come in, John? Yes, come in, York. I've been waiting for you. Oh. Is this Frankie Austin? Yes. We've been having a little talk. Well, what did you get? Well, here's the note that was found on Fulton. Let me see it. Right. Thanks. Austin. Yeah? Is that your signature? Let's see. There you are. Yeah. I didn't write anything like that. I don't think Austin killed Fulton, John. Oh? That's what I've been trying to tell him. You see, in addition to Fulton's footprints at the scene of the crime, I found some made by high heels. A dang. And, John, there's... Traces of woman's face powder on the note as if it had been carried in a handbag. Hey. You can even smell it. Hey, wait a minute. I'm beginning to get the whole picture. What do you mean? I told you this was a frame. And now I know who's behind it, my sister-in-law. How do we know she wasn't working with you? Look, believe me, she wasn't. She hung this on me. Where can she be located? Wherever my wife is. All right, Austin. We'll check on your story. <laughs> you packed yet? Oh, I'm having a terrible time, Chris. I can't get everything in. Look, we're wasting time. we got to get out of here. Oh, we ain't coming back. I've got to take everything. And this book just won't fit in. So what? Leave it. Oh, I couldn't, Chris. It's my memory book. Look, stupid, you'll have the rest of your life to read it if the cops come here. Now, forget it. Why should the cops come here? Because we killed a guy, remember? Yeah, but you said they were going to blame Frankie for that. That's why you put that note in Mr. Fulton's pocket. Bunny, please, just keep moving. Okay. Have you got that address? Uh, it's on the table there. I tore it out. Right. Where are we going? Wherever the first thing's leaving for, and I hope it's Mexico. Mexico? What's the matter with that? But I can't speak Mexican. That is not your big handicap, kid. Come on, shut that bag up. All right, all right. I'm ready. Okay, now let's get out of here fast. Nobody home, John. Hmm. Well, we have Austin's key and a search warrant. Let's go in. Right. Go ahead, York. Yo. Man, I'll say they're not here. Look at the mess. Yes, well, let's take a look around. They didn't bother to take half of their clothes with them. Well, with $10,000, they wouldn't need to. Hey, we must have just missed them. Yeah? Look here. Cigarettes still burning in the ashtray. Oh. Well, now the question is, are they going underground in this area, or are hey, they going to... What have you got? No, maybe nothing, but... Look at this newspaper. What about it? Oh, it was lying over there open at this page. Yes? And there's a piece at the bottom corner missing. 
Yeah, and it wasn't clipped out either. No, it's torn out like whoever did it was in a hurry. What's the date on that paper? Uh, it's it's this morning's. Okay, get on the phone, ask the newspaper what's printed on page... Uh, 26. Page 26 at the bottom of column... column 8, and hurry. Right. But I tell you, we have no tour leaving for Mexico just now, madam. Then what have you got? And don't call me madam. I'm sorry. <laughs> he thinks you're married, Chris. Shut up. Here's what we can do for you. Shoot. Uh, we can get you on a train leaving in one hour for New Orleans. And from there, you can take a banana boat. A banana boat? What's that? One that carries bananas, obviously. Okay, okay. Fix uh. us up on that. But don't you want to know where the boat's going? Just book us and make it snappy. Very well. May I have your names, please? This is uh, Frankie Austin uh, and Miss Christine Wilson. Uh, who are you? How did you know our names? We're special agents of the FBI. Huh? The FBI? That's right. You're both under arrest for murder. Mur- Chris, I told you we Shut should... Shut up. It's too late for that, Miss Wilson. You've left tracks a mile wide, including the ad for this travel agency torn out of this morning's newspaper. All right. Come along, both of you. The three criminals in tonight's case were all punished to the full extent of the law. Frankie Austin was sent to a federal penitentiary for hijacking. His wife received a long prison term for her part in the killing of Fulton. And his sister-in-law was convicted of murder in the first degree. Whether the female of the species is more deadly than the male or not, In the field of human crime, she operates under the same handicap as the male. The same handicap which ultimately defeats all criminals. The inevitable clues which sooner or later fasten upon them the verdict of guilty. Before you hear about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, the Equitable Society wants to tell you about a citizen of whom your community can well be proud. And I mean your neighbor, the Equitable Society life insurance representative. Look to him for the financial security of life insurance. He's a man ready to serve you in the same spirit in which throughout 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has always served its members. His every working hour is devoted to building security through life insurance for you, your home, and your country. Next week... We will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swampland Kidnapping. The incident used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swampland Kidnapping on This Is Your FBI.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight's significant story will begin in just a moment. First, a brief word from the sponsor of This Is Your FBI, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Here at the Equitable Society, we have been working for 86 years on one of the things that you yourself are most concerned about, security for yourself and your loved ones. When we say you, we mean just that, you who are about to listen to this program. Even if you're not a member of the Equitable Society, you benefit indirectly through the stability that Equitable Society investments help bring to American industry and business. Get to know the Equitable Society life insurance representative in your community. You'll learn that it's a simple statement of exact fact that by serving Equitable Society members, he serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Delinquent Parents. In America today, for every 23 persons, there is one with an arrest record. And the tide of crime is rising. The greatest number of arrests in all age groups is of boys and girls 17 years old, and the number is growing. Tonight's case from the juvenile files of your FBI is a drop of water in the rising tide. There is a popular fallacy that youthful law violators are most always products of poverty or underprivileged. If this were true, Abraham Lincoln might well have become the arch-criminal of his day. The truth is that they are, with rare exception, the products of parental neglect, a condition just as prevalent in homes of the well-to-do as in homes of the poor. Take, for example, the Medford home in a suburb of New York City. It is a few minutes before noon. Drake Medford, 16, comes out of his improvised chemical laboratory to make a request of his mother. Mom? Mom, would you mind Not if you... Not Drake. Can't you see I'm rushing? But, Mom, I just wanted to... Drake, I simply got to make the 1240. Bertha will be furious if I'm not there for the curtain. But I thought since you're going into New York... I won't have time to do any errands for you, Drake. It would only take you a minute, Mom, and I'm running low on nitric acid. Well, I... What? Nitric acid. Good heavens, do you want to blow me up? Nitric acid is perfectly harmless until combined with... Ah, Well, I'm certainly not going to combine any with me. Okay. Whatever it is you're doing, Drake, it'll have to wait long enough for you to drive me to the station. All right. Be home for dinner? No, I'm never at home for dinner when I go to a matinee. Seems like you're hardly ever home for dinner. What, dear? Never mind. You'd better go back the car out. I'll be ready to go by that time. Uh, Ronnie's coming over after a while. May I use the car if we want to go somewhere? I don't care what you do, dear. Uh, say, by the way, Mom... Please, Drake, not now. Some other time. Some other time, some other time. It's always that way. I don't stand there mumbling. Go get the car out. But you never have any time for me. What? You said you never have time for anything concerning me. Why, Drake. The idea, how can you say such a thing? Never mind. Drake. Guess you're sorry you ever had a son. And so am I sometimes. You're talking other nonsense. You know perfectly... Heavens, look at the time. Okay, I'll go get the car. And please hurry, dear. Sure, you can't afford to miss the curtain. That's something really important. Drake! Come 
on in, Ronnie. I'm back in the lab. Okay. Anybody home? Nope. Well, how's it coming? It's all done. How much of the stuff did you make? That little bottle full. Hey, that's enough nitroglycerin to blow up the Croton Dam. Well, you asked me to make plenty. That's right. Hey, why do you want it? Drake, that stuff's gonna get us something we both want awfully bad. What? That sailboat. The nitro? I don't get it. Look, we need 150 bucks, don't we? Yeah. And a fat chance we've got of getting it from our folks. They've turned us down three times already. I know. And we're gonna go out and get it ourselves. How do you mean? Remember my Uncle Ben who lives in Connecticut? Yeah, he won't give you 150 bucks. He will, too, but he won't know it. How? Well, he and the family all have gone to Florida, but there's always money in his wall safe, and it'll be a cinch for us to blow it up. Blow up his wall safe? Sure, he's got tons of dough. He won't miss it. We'll even tell him someday who pulled the job, and he'll get a big laugh out of it. Oh, but it's not right. Look, it's in the family, isn't it? But even so... What's the matter, you scared? Oh, it's not that especially. Sure you are. You're scared your mother will find out. That's where you're wrong, Ronnie. Huh? She doesn't care what I do. And I don't either anymore. What's the matter? Have a fight? No. I'm just realizing where I stand around here. Well, I got wise to that in my house long ago. She lives her life, so from now on I'm going to live mine. Well, what are we waiting for? Nothing. We'll blow that safe tonight. <laughs> tools. You got the nitro? Yeah. Come on. Let's get out of the car. Wait a minute. You're not getting cold feet, are you? No, no. I thought you said they'd all gone to Florida. What do you mean? That light upstairs. Oh, that's Waters. The butler. What'll we do? I won't know anything's going on until it's too late. How are we going to get in? They left the key with the folks. I slipped it out and had a copy made. Come on. Don't close it. Okay. Okay, here we are. I'll open the door. I'll go first with the flashlight. You follow me. The safe's in the library, just off to the left. Okay, there's the safe. That wall there. I'll drill a hole first. You get the nitro ready. Okay. Ronnie. What's the matter? Listen. Put out the flashlight, quick. Right. What do we do? I'll take care of Waters. Hey, Ronnie, you don't mean you'll... Shh. He's turned on the living room light. Quiet and keep down. That's funny. I just sworn I had to... Oh! Mm -hmm. Hey, Ronnie, we better get out of here. Not until we get what we came for. About an hour later, a telephone rang on the desk of Agent in Charge Durant of the New Haven office of the FBI. Durant speaking. This is police headquarters at Meadowbrook. Oh, hello. What's up? We think this is a case for the FBI. Oh? What happened? The wall safe in the Pomeroy house here was blown a while ago, and the butler was slugged. Well, what's the FBI angle? They got only $50 in cash, but took jewelry valued at over $5,000. We've reason to believe the thieves are from New York. Went back across the state line with the stuff. Well, that comes within our jurisdiction, all right. What do you want us to do? I'll start a special agent over to Meadowbrook right away to investigate. We'll be waiting for him. Right. Better take it easy, Drake. We don't want to get pinched for speeding now. Oh, I wish you hadn't taken that jewelry. What good's $50 going to do us? What good's the jewelry going to do us? Don't you know what the guys in the movies do with this stuff? Oh, you mean... Sure, hock it before it gets hot. Oh, where are you going to pawn it tonight? Oh, we can't tonight. But we'll be in a New York pawn shop with it first thing in the morning. Well, what are we going to do tonight? We're going to go home like nothing happened. Then you pick me up early in the morning and we'll head for a pawn shop. 
Look, Ronnie, I... Now, don't go getting nervous on me. You just sit tight and we're in clover. Back already, Tom? Yes. Pick up any leads? The butler is positive the robbers were very young, just kids. Oh? He started into the library to investigate the noise he heard, and had just caught a quick glimpse of one of them when the other one knocked him out. Oh, could he give you a description of the other one he saw? He didn't get that good look at him. Oh, how did they blow the safe? It was a nitro job. Hmm. The kids in nitro somehow or other don't quite go together, do they? No. How did they gain entrance to the house? <laughs> the easiest way possible. What? They had a key, apparently, opened the front door and walked right in. Well, what do you know about that? Guess you're thinking the same thing I am. Inside job? That's the way it struck me. Well, before we go to work on that, telephone the New York office and give them the details and the description of the missing jewelry. Okay, Drake. Nobody in the shop but the pawnbroker himself. Come on. Look, wouldn't you rather I'd wait out here? What's the matter? You getting scared again? Well, I thought he might be less suspicious if you went in by yourself. No, it's just the other way around. Come on. Okay. Well, good morning, boys. What can I do for you? Uh, we want to pawn something. That's my business. What have you got? Here you are. Well. What's the matter? Diamond bracelet? Pearl necklace? Where'd you get this? Well, uh, well, you see, it belongs to my sister. Oh? Uh, I mean, she didn't want to come here herself, and uh, she asked me to take care of it for her. Uh-huh. Uh, how much can we, uh, I mean, how much can she get for it? You wait a minute. I'll take them in back and examine them. Oh, well, okay, but we're in kind of a hurry. I'll be right back. Well, what did he have to go back there for? To examine it, like he said. Now, don't stop running it. Ronnie, listen. He's dialing a number. Yeah. Maybe he's calling the police. Let's get out of here. Wait a minute. You watch the front. Where are you going? I said watch the front. Um, just a minute, mister. Something wrong? Oh, uh, we changed our minds. We want the jewelry back. You can't have it back. I think this jewelry's stolen. Give me that jewelry. No, you can't. Give me that... Come on, Drake. What happened? Let's get out of here fast. While waiting for tonight's file to resume, as it will in just a moment... Here's a message of particular importance to you and your family from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. This week at the Equitable Society, I heard a story of hope and courage about two young people who had everything that makes for success. Health, a home, and he had a good job, fine prospects for advancement, and a life insurance policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. But then hard times struck, and the temptation came to surrender their life insurance policy. But somehow or other, they managed to keep it in force. And as a matter of fact, they are now, this week, about to retire in comfort on its proceeds. And that same dogged determination never to let a life insurance policy lapse is typical of more and more people. The figures prove it. Equitable society members are placing higher value on their life insurance than ever before paying premiums promptly, frequently paying them well in advance. Yes, your life insurance, in whatever company, we hope it's with the Equitable Society, is a valuable possession. Keep it in force, no matter what. And when you need advice, speak to your Equitable Society representative, who is trained to help you use life insurance to your best advantage. He wants you to be secure. He wants you to be safe. And he wants you to understand, as he does, that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security through life insurance for you, your home, and your country. And 
now back to the FBI file, The Delinquent Parent. We repeat, mothers and fathers of America, the greatest number of criminal arrests today in all age groups is of boys and girls 17 years old. And back of it all, with rare exception, is parental neglect. The parent who doesn't take time to understand, to guide, to make a companion of his boy or girl, may one day have to watch his child serve time. Mrs. Medford's attitude of utter indifference concerning her son, Drake, cannot now be far from a severe shock. The pawnbroker, struck down by Drake's companion, Ronnie, was taken by police to a New York hospital for treatment of his head wound. An official visitor enters his room. Mr. Adams, I'm agent in charge, Durant, of the New Haven office of the FBI. This is Special Agent Baker. How do you do? Yes. FBI, New Haven? Yes, we came to New York early this morning to follow up an investigation of a jewel robbery up in Meadowbrook last night. Uh Uh-huh. When the police reported to our office here what took place in your shop a while ago, I thought there might be a connection. Uh, What can I tell you? What kind of jewelry were you offered? A diamond and emerald bracelet and a pearl necklace. That checks all right. And you told the police the jewels were offered by two boys? Yes, but they didn't look like criminals. They... They were so young and clean-looking. Could you describe them more fully? Uh, Let me see. Try to be as accurate as you can, Mr. Adams. We have a theory that one of the boys was related to the family that was robbed, but we want to make certain before taking any steps. Uh, The one who did the talking, he was uh, 16 or 17. Uh Uh-huh. He was a big boy, like my son who plays football. And he's got red hair. That's what we wanted to find out. Yes. And now, Mr. Adams, if you'll give us a brief description of the other lad as quickly as you can, we'll be on our way. Stick to this highway, Drake. When we get up around Peekskill, I get another idea. Hey, what are you doing? I'm going to turn around. Turn around? What do you mean? We're going back. Are you crazy? No, that's why we're going back. I don't get you. We're going to go back and tell them we did it and get everything straightened out. Now I know you're crazy. That's the only right thing to do, Ronnie. That's the only thing that'll land us in the hooskow. Not if we confess. Look, Drake, uncle or no uncle, we blew his safe, stole money and jewelry, slugged the butler, and a while ago we slugged the pawnbroker. Maybe we even... Well, even what? Well, I hit that old man pretty hard, and I might have hit him too hard. You mean he's dead? Well, he could be. We can't afford to go back and maybe have a murder pinned on us. Murder? Yeah. We're wanted by the police now, but good. We didn't mean to go this far, but we did. And we're criminals now. And there's only one thing we can do about it. We can't go back home. We've got to go on. Don't you see? Where did you say to head for? Peachskill. Just a minute. Yes? Mrs. Medford? Yes? I'm Special Agent Baker of the FBI. FBI? That's right. May I come in? Well, of course. Thank you. I have only a minute. I'm dashing over to the club for a bridge luncheon. I really wanted to see your son, Drake. Drake? Yes. Well, I, I don't believe he's here. Oh, Drake! There, you see, he isn't home. He went off somewhere in the car early this morning. Do you know where he went? Well, I don't believe he said. Have you any idea where he was last night? Good heavens, I'm afraid not. I never try to keep up with that boy. Obviously. I beg your pardon? Perhaps if you had kept up with Drake, Mrs. Medford, we shouldn't be trying to catch up with him now. What did you say? Ronnie's mother doesn't know where he is either. I was just there. I... I don't understand. Your son, Mrs. Medford, and Ronnie 
are wanted by the FBI. Can you understand that? Wanted by the FBI? Yes. Oh, no. There must be some mistake. Do you think so? I know so. How can you know that when you've bothered to know so little else about your son? But, but I... At least I, you must have known that Drake has a little chemical lab in the house. Yes, I... But did I, you ever bother to know what he can mix in that lab? Well, no, I... One of I, the things he mixes is nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin? Yes. Now, you'd better get a good grip on yourself for this, Mrs. Medford. What? Last night, Drake and Ronnie blew open the safe in the Pomeroy home. Oh. Stole money and over $5,000 worth of jewelry. Struck down the butler with a deadly weapon. Oh, no. And this morning, struck down an old pawnbroker who got suspicious when they tried to pawn the jewelry. Oh, it isn't true. It can't be true. Have you ever bothered yourself enough about your son to see that it couldn't be true? But Drake couldn't do such a thing. I'm sorry, Mrs. Medford. But because you haven't faced the fact of your responsibility to your son... You will have to face now the fact that he's wanted in connection with three crimes. Oh, Drake. My poor, poor Drake. I'm afraid I'll have to put out an alarm right away. May I have the license number and description of your car, please? Thanks a lot, Sergeant. I'll get on it right away. Oh, Baker. Yes? Looks like we've gotten quick results from the alarm. Really? Yes, I've just talked to police headquarters at Peekskill. Yes? They found the Medford car abandoned down by the freight yard. I see. Well, it's pretty obvious what they did next. Exactly. We're on our way to Peekskill right now. I'm having them check all freight train schedules, and by the time we get there, we should be able to figure out where those youngsters are. Wish this train would get moving again. I bet we've been parked on the siding two hours. What time is it, Drake? What? I say, what time is it? I don't know. I can't see my watch. Okay. It doesn't make any difference anyway. Ronnie? Yeah? I want to go home. Look, are you going to start that again? I've made up my mind this time, Ronnie. Sit down. You can do whatever you want to, but I'm going to get off this train right now and start back home. Are you coming with me? No, and you're not going either. Yes, I am. Wait a minute. Don't try to stop me. Look, if you haven't got any more sense than to go back, I've got to stop you for your own good. I don't care what they do to me. Suppose the pawnbroker is dead. I guess you want to go to the electric chair for murder. I didn't murder anybody. So you're going back and squeal on me and get yourself off. I didn't mean it that way. I mean I'm not really a criminal and you're not either. We just didn't stop to think what we were doing. But we did it. And I'm sorry for it, too. So are you and you know it. I want to go back home and get it off my conscience, and you ought to do it, too. You're just scared to be out on your own. You want to run home to your mother. What's wrong with that? You said yourself she didn't care anything about you. It doesn't make any difference. I care about her, and I can't do this. I'm getting off this train right now. Oh, no, you're Let not. Let go of me, Ronnie. No, you're That'll not. That'll do, boys. Huh? Well, who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. What? FBI? And I'm awfully glad we waited to overhear what you were saying, Drake. It'll make things easier for both of you. Yes, sir. And you were wrong about your mother. She does care. She cares an awful lot. So, come on home. Because of their extreme youth, Ronnie and Drake, after a full confession of their guilt, were given the opportunity of becoming good citizens in the future by being paroled. And now, an important message about tonight's case from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A crime wave of growing proportions is upon us. It demands immediate attention on the part of every right-thinking American. Increasingly, it is becoming a youth problem. Last year, more youngsters 17 years of age were arrested than in any other age group. Now, here is a challenge for every right-thinking American. 
Every community resource should be immediately mobilized, and every parent and adult should take their proper place in the fight against lawlessness. We have many splendid youth-serving agencies. Tonight, I want to single out one that has been tried and proven, the Boys Clubs of America. With over one quarter million members and 260 individual clubs, the Boys Clubs of America are celebrating their 40th anniversary. I have studied and seen the Boys Clubs at work from these groups come thousands of law-abiding citizens who are an asset to their communities. By developing good citizens, they are preventing crime. This is Boys Club's week, and I would urge upon my listeners greater support of this worthwhile activity and the extension of the facilities of the Boys Clubs of America. Before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, a final important piece of information from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for the financial security of life insurance. In the past 86 years, the Equitable Society has weathered four wars and seven major depressions. During that time, over five and one-half billion dollars have been paid to policyholders and beneficiaries. This tower of strength, security, and stability is represented in your community by a man whom hundreds of your fellow citizens know as their good friend, the Equitable Society representative, who, like your FBI, is dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. <laughs> Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Nylon Hijacker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. However, all other names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Nylon Hijacker. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.